Welcome to the Jed Burke Podcast. I'm the creator and host, Fran Rachopi. Each episode, I speak with transformative leaders, visionaries, drivers of change, and those dedicated to winning no matter the challenge. The Jedberg Podcast is founded in the lineage of the special operations Jedberg teams of the past and is produced in partnership with Talent Workgroup, a management consulting and executive search firm focused on helping you optimize the people side of your business. We're sponsored by Jersey Mike Subs. Together, we share the mission of giving, making a difference in someone's life. Visit the Jedberg Podcast, Talent War Group, and Jersey Mike Subs on the web and on all social media. A percentage of all proceeds is dedicated to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. They had already been in six months. We didn't realize it. Yeah. When we saw the Guardians of Peace on the screen, that was a wiper malware. So when you connected from anywhere in the world, we're in 50 countries, 150 locations, plus all the productions. When you connected, the meltdown on your hard drive started. And within a few seconds, all that data is gone forever. Ever since 9-11, ever since Pan Am 103, ever since those first days of aviation security. And I'll remind everybody, next year is the 50th anniversary of airplane security. Everything you experience is done for a reason. Okay, don't complain about having to take your shoes off. Security is one of our most basic foundational needs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs puts safety and security at the bottom of the pyramid, right between our need for food, water, rest, and warmth, and our need for belonging and love. We look for safety and security in every aspect of our lives. We face threats and risks walking down the street, driving our cars, sitting on an airplane, or even cutting a piece of fruit. Our companies face risks to intellectual property, assets, people traveling to support the mission. As a country, we face national security risks posed by other nations and terrorist organizations. As people, employees, businesses, and as a nation, we look to the global security industry to identify the threats we face, then analyze and mitigate the risk to keep us safe. To catch up on the latest trends in equipment and security, I went to Global Security Exchange in Atlanta a few weeks ago. GSX is hosted by the security industry's accrediting body, as is International. It's the largest security trade show in the world and has everything from uniforms and cameras to robotic dogs and counter drone sensors. I've been in the security industry a long time and I've been fortunate to have some of the most impactful leaders in the industry as mentors and friends. So to talk about security and the threats we face as companies, entrepreneurs, and employees, I asked two of security's most respected authorities to sit down with me on the convention floor. Rich Davis is the former chief security officer of United Airlines. Steve Bernard is the former chief security officer of Sony Pictures Entertainment. Rich started his career in United's Chicago kitchen and worked his way through the ranks to lead one of the most targeted and high-profile global operations on the planet. Steve earned a Bronze Star in Vietnam, came home to continue service in law enforcement, and later made the switch to corporate security, leading movie and film production from the L.A. studio lot to the most remote regions of the world. Rich oversaw United's response to the 9-11 attacks, which involved two of United's airplanes. Steve led Sony through the North Korean cyber attack that shuttered the entire Sony computer network after the premiere of The Interview starring Seth Rogen and James Franco, which, in my opinion, was a pretty funny movie regardless of what Chairman Kim thinks. Rich, Steve, and I cover everything security, including the evolution of the industry, the threats we face in both the physical and cyber domains, how thought leaders are needed in senior security positions, and how we build a security culture in our organizations. Steve and Rich are two of the leading Jedbergs in the industry and now serve as senior advisors with International SOS, providing health and security risk mitigation for businesses of all sizes and locations. The world's a complex place, and today's companies require dedicated support for the protection of their number one asset, their people. International SOS is the industry leader in travel risk management, medical support, evacuations, mental health, crisis management, and workforce resilience. On the ground in over 90 countries and 1,000 locations, International SOS is there 24-7, no matter the challenge. Check out my conversation with Rich and Steve from the International SOS booth at GSX on your favorite podcast platforms. Watch the full video version of our conversation on YouTube. Subscribe to us and follow at Jedberg Podcast on all social media. Check out our website at jedbergpodcast.com. Learn more about International SOS at internationalsos.com and on social media at INTLSOS. Steve Bernard is the founder of Bernard Global and Rich Davis is the founder of Rich Davis Security Consulting. Find them both on LinkedIn. Steve, Rich, welcome to the Jedberg Podcast. Thank Happy you, Fran. Here. Thank you. The whole podcast is about visionaries, drivers of change, those dedicated to winning no matter the challenge. Security is so important in our lives in t today's world we're seeing so many things today that we haven't seen in centuries uh, i'm sorry decades but 
you have been each at the forefront of major corporations. Steve, as the chief security officer at Sony Pictures, and Rich, you at United Airlines. And we're going to talk about the magnitude of these organizations. But to be able to sit in a room with you, learn from you, share those experiences, has always been an honor of my career in global security. And now to be able to share that with our audience is truly a tremendous opportunity. And I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit with me for a few minutes. In the ISOS booth, too, which is great, great setup. Good. The, I want to start by talking about As Is International and GSX, because we are in an organization, in an industry, when we talk about global security, that requires standards. And I think about when we've developed security programs, and what's the very first thing we always talk about? We talk about standards, we talk a bit about policy, often we get wrapped up around policy, but it's really about how do we identify standards for what we do at every level of the organization, as is, is the organization in global security that sets a lot of those standards that we all then use to build so many of our programs. GSX is the annual trade show. And this is where we go out to share knowledge, gain knowledge, learn the new technology, better ourselves, whether you're new into the industry or whether you've been around for 30, 40 years, everybody's here because this is how we continue to innovate, build community, come together. Security is defined as, quote, the state of being free from, from danger or threat, unquote. I pulled that off Google, so. We live in a complex, changing world that's changing by the minute. Geopolitical risk exists everywhere. You've both dealt with that. We're going to talk about it all the way down to local things that happen outside of our offices and outside of our homes to trips and falls in the workplace. As a global security director, as a chief security officer, you have to deal with everything across that whole spectrum. How do you define a security professional and why is this organization of ASIS International and the GSX Conference so important to setting those standards? Steve, I'll start with you. Okay. Thank you for the entree, that's great. <laughs> um, so I've been a member of ASIS 35 years. That's it? That dates me a little bit. <laughs> um, and when I became a, a CSO or a director of security in uh, 1983, there was no standards or guidelines or policies or, or re it really, it, it was so new. And I bought the protection of assets manual and it, it really saved me. It made a difference in, in my ability to really start to build a really viable program in a, in a company that really had great need and risk. So it's, but now let's fast forward to being here. I haven't been to one of these in three years. COVID kind of got in the way and some other things. But as you know, and Rich knows, he and I walked the halls here for two and a half days now. Well, it's and like two celebrities walking down the hall. <laughs> oh my God. You can, stop it that, takes you two that. days to actually yeah, walk yeah, the exactly. floor because you can't you make keep it getting stopped. <laughs> and, uh, but it's great. It's so great. And nothing replaces this. Zoom Air, I'm sorry, it's been great. Mm -hmm. but being together and having these one-off conversations and, and really finding out what's on people's minds, awesome. So I'll, let me shift over to Rich. So it is quite awesome, Fran, and, and I too want to thank you for your kindest of words. That was very flattering and humbling. When you, when you come into a building like this, uh, as is GSX, and it's my first one in three years as well because of the pandemic, it's quite overwhelming when you look at how many people are working to support you in security and all of the different elements that come into it. I wish 60 Minutes could spend an entire hour going up and down these aisles and hallways looking at the very different elements going all the way to, from uniforms to revolving doors mm -hmm. to robots walking around the floor. It's a robotic dog that's robotic walking dog. up and down the escalator. There's a yellow one and there's a white one. <laughs> yeah. I've seen them both. But it's, it's so wonderful to see how many people are contrib contributing to our industry. And we're all about assessing risk, assessing threats, and how to counter those threats. Because the most important thing we do is protect people and assets. Mm -hmm. And this building reassures how many millions of dollars are being spent 
in that world. Why do organizations need thought leaders as their chief security officers? And I ask you this question because we're going to talk about the evolution of security and security industry. And it used to be about guards. You know, and we said, you know, you throw bodies at the problem. You got a problem. You got a door, put a guard on it. You, know, you need, you got two doors, put two guards on it. And now you walk through here and we still need security officers. So all, all the security officer listeners, very, very valuable and important component of our security strategy in organizations is the officers because customer service comes first and, and they are the front line of defense. But when we talk about putting people in positions of leadership within security, why is thought leadership so important? especially in this area of safeguarding people and assets all over the world and the digital connectivity and all of that. I think the big deal um, in leadership today is the risks are changing by the moment. The digital risks, the you know, inflation, mental health. We, we could sit here and actually make up a list of probably 100 items that I can think of that somehow should be on the radar of a thought leader mm -hmm. and every day refocus that lens on what is it I need to worry about today? What is it my employer needs to worry about? And how do I do the best job I can to enable the business, protect the people, protect the assets, um, and, and take us forward? And part of it is also, you better understand, you better have business savvy. You're not there because you don't have the best security program in the world. You're there to enable and align with your business. Mm -hmm. Rich. Steve's absolutely right. Um, the different security responsibilities that we have, Sony, uh, t uh, take Merck, take Boeing, take United Airlines, Delta, American, everybody. Everybody has their own top risks. It's called enterprise risk management. Thought leaders got to understand what's coming at me. Crisis management begins long before the crisis has arrived. Mm -hmm. And you have to be thinking ahead, what's coming at me, what's coming down the road. And when you're able to communicate that to leaders that understand what the risk is to their corporation, each of us are all different. We have different risks. For instance, catastrophic sabotage, high on every airline's list. Maybe not so high on other companies. Mm -hmm. Labor unrest, another example, weather, geopolitical. Whatever they are, wherever you're a thought leader, whoever you're working for, you have to understand that, what's coming, what can harm this company, and how do we take care of those risks, and that's good thought leadership. I mean, the, the tagline of the podcast is how you prepare today determines success tomorrow, because it's all about that preparation. Without it, you, you cannot respond in crisis if you haven't thought about all of these contingencies and all of these crises right. that can occur and how are we gonna then think through the solution. A lot of times we talk about not necessarily making the, the book that tells you what to do, but how do we make the checklist that tells you how to think? Well, exactly. Uh, you have to work within your corporation with different entities such as your legal department, your- Everybody loves them. Finance department. <laughs> your insurers, and the C-suite is very interested in what all of those entities have to say. And when you practice things that can harm you, you're prepared when that day arrives, whether it's a tsunami, mm -hmm. whether it's an accident, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think uh, Rich is absolutely right on that point though. Let me add one more thing. What I think we fail to do oftentimes is to have a a gathering of those functional areas with decision makers and sit down and have a conversation about, okay, what if these things happen? Who's going to make what decision when? Let's redefine roles and responsibilities and let's make hard decisions in that room before that day comes. And you know, I think about the Sony attack of North Korea. Um, yeah. Boy, tough. De the decisions we made on day one probably saved the company. Yeah. That's how critical it is. So delegating, escalating, you know, defining roles, um, and not having, you know, conflict in the yeah. room on the day of. Yeah. 
Let's talk about you guys for a second. And what you said, you, you, you mentioned you dated yourself. So I'll, I'll, I'll date you a little bit more, but starting with, we'll start with Rich. Rich, as I mentioned before, you retired chief security officer at United Airlines. You were there for 25 years. The rumor has it that you began there as a baggage handler and worked your way up. So you'll have to negate or confirm that for me. But tremendous career through a defining period of time for that that company and that organization. Senior advisor to the State Department's Overseas Security Advisory Council, OSAC, and the Domestic Security Ad, Ad, Advisory Council, DSAC. Both you and Steve are advisors there. You're on the board of directors at International Security Management Association. We know it as, as ISMA president and board of directors at the International Security Foundation, ISF. Board of directors of the Domestic Security Partnership, six times six-time chairman for Airlines for America Security Council and three times chairman of the International Air Transport Association, IATA. Is that it? Wow. <laughs> Did I uh, sum it up? Very, very close. Um, <laughs> Since you put it that way. <laughs> I didn't know I did all those things. No, seriously, um, uh, I worked for United Airlines for 40 years. 40, okay. 40 years. Uh, and I started in the kitchen. In the I actually started in the kitchen. It's a was, better story than the one I heard. I have a pretty unique story. Uh, proud of it. I, I worked in the kitchen for six months. That was back in 1978, one of the big ways to get into the company. Uh, in six months, I did get uh, promoted and moved to baggage handling, which I did for about three years. Mm-hmm. And then I advanced to reservations, and then uh, I did really well at that. Uh, I didn't know why I was doing really well at that, but I think I I learned why. Uh, I was actually an usher in my teen years in Chicago, uh, seeing the Rolling Stones, Elvis Presley, all the sporting events. Oh, like oh, at at concerts and and sporting events. All of that. So you were an usher in the stands. Just an usher. Here's your seat. Uh huh. But what happened was in 1973, President Nixon ordered aviation security to begin to counter the hijackings. Mm -hmm. And the city of Chicago hired our ushering company to do that. And I lived on the Northwest side, so I was spending a lot of time at the airport as one of the original screeners uh, in 1973. Fast forward, um, I graduated from college and I went into the headquarters of that ushering company there was a little attrition and i found myself running o'hara airport for that company at age 23. wow so i had my uh uh beginning uh of security didn't know this would turn into a career by any means i had a career path in reservations sales and united was acquiring pan am international at the time You want me to go a little further with this? (laughs) Please. So uh, I'm at headquarters working in uh, international planning, reservations and sales. And then in uh, December of 1988, uh, Pan Am 103 exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland. Mm -hmm. Uh, Within weeks, my company said, Rich, we need you in the security department ASAP because you have an aviation security background. I joined the uh, department shortly after Pan Am 103 in uh, 1989, and then um, I became the chief security officer by 1997 uh, for the next 23 years. And that's the capsulized version. Wow. It's pretty cool. That is cool. That's that's absolutely incredible. I mean, we talk about following your passion, following your dreams, so many, so many different conversations, and just working hard. You know, I mean, w- working hard every single day to make a difference. Working hard and then developing your department, finding people with similar passions. For instance, all the people in this GSX meeting, people that are contributing to the ultimate goal of all security leaders, protect your people and assets. Steve, Steve, you served in the US Army. We share that common background and we've talked about it you know, at length in our relationship. But you know, thank you for your service as, and as you. a predecessor to, to my generation and really set the conditions for so much of what the U.S. Army and the U.S. military are. But awarded the Bronze Star in Vietnam. 
came back, became a police officer in right. Iowa. Right. Then after 12 years, made the jump into corporate security, worked for a petroleum, petroleum company, and then at the 3Com in U.S. Robotics. And then in 2002, took over Sony Pictures. How did you know all that? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've known you for a bit. And didn't you army guys do some kitchen work too? Did you peel <laughs> yeah. potatoes? Oh, yeah. oh all, you all right, have. So you started on a buffer. Yeah, mess all really Start well. Start in those kitchens. <laughs> and but, serve slop. <laughs> but... You, you you were at Sony for 17 years. Right. Transformed that organization w through so much technological advance. I mean, you too, Rich, aviation has come so well. But so much technical advance uh, during that time when it comes to film and television production, totally different game right. when you left from when you got there. You're also, as I mentioned, a senior advisor to OSAC and DSEC and a graduate of the FBI National Academy. Why get into security after Vietnam? I, I think it was kind of a natural transition yeah. for, for so many of us <laughs> for combat vets when they came back to get into law enforcement. And then in, once you're in law enforcement, especially the last several years, what we've seen is that's where companies, when they want to hire a security professional, tends to be where they go to look, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's FBI or local law enforcement, whatever it may be. So a lot of people had a law enforcement background that have come into the profession. I don't think it's as much that way today from a standpoint of is it really necessary because what we talked about before, what you really need are good thought leaders, good managers, business savvy, um, and you know you can hire the security done and mm -hmm. for the most part. There's so many, that's one of the things that we see here. There's so many amazing providers out there that offer a lot of services. A security director today or a CSO doesn't have to be the expert in all this. Mm -hmm. They have to figure out how do they add the greatest value and the, set the strategy lead the team, and then diversify a little bit. Find other vendors and providers that can offer those services for you to give it a holistic approach. Um, for me, you know, my first job, age 15, I was a groom for five racehorses. And really? I took one for a walk one day, and he <laughs> deliberately stepped on my foot. And another time I was in the stall cleaning it and somebody started a tractor and I had to dive over the chains to get out. <laughs> so that's how I kind of started. And uh, that was interesting. But um, you know, when I went in 1983 um, into the private sector as a director, they didn't even have CSO then, mm -hmm. it was director of corporate security. I only knew three or four other people in the world who did that. And I, I jumped into the world's largest fresh meats processing company uh -huh. that was owned by Occidental Petroleum, and we were at war with everybody. Yeah. I mean, we had lots going on, I'll just say that. Uh, anything you can imagine. So it was like I had a police department on day one. And I had to figure out how to run that, and it was all over the place. Um, so from that, I started building a network. And I, I want to comment just real quick on that, how important that is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did for my career, I built a network. And, and people like you, friends all over the world, who I still know how to get in a hold of today. And when I was thinking about retiring in 2018 from Sony, and I knew I was going to launch my business. But I wouldn't say you're retired. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> no, you, you can say you're yeah, retired. But no. it's, uh, yeah, the treadmill keeps running. I don't know how to turn it off. But um, the network I had then was awesome. Worldwide, private sector, public sector, great. I probably have doubled it in the last four and a half years. Yeah. Unbelievable. But the network and the relationships, that's what this is all about. I, there's nowhere in the world that something happens that I can't figure out how to get it resolved. I, I just feel that way, yeah. that, that confident. And so that's really important. I want to ask you both about, you mentioned that you know, back, if you, you go back into the 80s, you go back into the 90s, and you know, security and the perception of security was so different than it is you know, in, in companies, number one, and two, in a lot of our back of our minds. I mean, Rich, you mentioned the, the bombing of Pan Am 103 was, it was a defining moment when you look at you know, how the public thinks about terrorism. You know, and you had that situation in Iran with that, you know, through that period of time, too. But when you think back about the perspective that companies, employees, executives, the government had about corporate security during that time, what was their perspective? Gates, guards, and guns. Yeah. That was it. Maybe. Right? <laughs> it, 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 security, were you ever invited to the 
C-suite to sit at the table in the conference room and be a decision maker and an influencer uh, and help really guide that company, you had to fight your way into that room. And today, it's still, sadly, somewhat that way. Yeah. Rich? So we had um, similar, but we were quite different. And one of the primary differences was uh, the airlines of the world are regulated by the governments. So while we had guns, gates, and guards, and we had physical security responsibilities, and we had investigations to do, and those type of things, we also had this immense responsibility to uh, follow the regulation set out by the governments of the world, primarily the FAA before 9-11 and the TSA after Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. But if we flew to Japan or London, we're dealing with the Japanese government and the British government right. as well for every government around the world. So we had to pay attention and the C-suites had to pay attention and we did that at United. All the airlines did that. And that difference was a big deal because the aviation industry was a significant target. We'll call them the bad guys. The threat, they wanted to kill us. Yeah. They wanted to hurt our people and they wanted to hurt our assets. So we had top shelf attention to this, especially upon the realization of Pan Am 103 and what damage the bad guys could do to our industry. And Pan Am 103 was a seismic event mm -hmm. that changed the mindset of a lot of people in our industry. I want to talk for a second about the roles and responsibilities that you each had because I don't think people truly understand the magnitude and the complexity of these organizations. So I'm going to throw some, I'm going to throw some more lists at you. I like lists. If okay. people, everyone who listens to the podcast knows I like lists. But United Airlines, 80, almost 85,000 employees, $68 billion in assets, $24 billion in revenue, 840 aircraft roughly, 500 or so on order, 360 destinations around the world, flies to all six inhabited co continents, about 4,500 daily flights unless they're canceling them. <laughs> Which Stop recently, that. Yeah, Stop that. Don't, don't say that. I didn't mean it. <laughs> and then over 168 million passengers are moves, moved every year. It's the third largest airline in the world. You said... Quote, we're responsible for revenue protection, passenger facilitation, compliance with customs and border protection laws, compliance with all countries' security laws, company investiga investigations and compliance with our regulators, as well as the geopolitical oversight of the world, including the United, the United States. Un unquote, perfect situation right now, the, the war in Ukraine. I fly to India once a quarter for, for my job as the chief people officer at analytics and that flight used to be 16 hours. It's now 17 hours because we can't fly over Eastern Europe. You can't fly over Ukraine. You got you to bypass it. The magnitude of this organization, when you think about coming to work every day and you think of the, the prioritization of the threats and how the threats transition into risks that then sit across each one of these domains, each one of these, um, these verticals almost that you've laid out in this, in this quote and in your comments a few minutes ago, how do you prioritize and triage those when you show up every morning, if you actually go to sleep <laughs> and can sleep and wake up and start a new day? It, it, that's a very challenging question to answer, prioritizing uh, all of the above. My sense and my thought process was they're all number one priorities because failure in any area in the aviation industry could lead to one of those top enterprise risk management fears, catastrophic sabotage. For instance, where can the bad guys place a bomb or where can the bad guys carry a bomb on? When you think about it, there's quite a few places. And we have to plug all of those holes we have to plug all of those gaps. We have to protect everybody every way we can. And it's a tremendous team effort, which includes the governments, the intel agencies, the people on the ground, the people in offices, 
the pilots, the flight attendants, overall security awareness, not just for the planes, but in all of our facilities as well. Catastrophic tab uh, sabotage can include the airports themselves, as seen in Brussels and Amsterdam uh, not so long ago. It can happen at any facility. It can happen in a building. So how can you say that's 10th priority or 20th? You can't. It's all of the above. So the immense team effort from everyone, especially all of these people in this building today, they all have a piece of the pie, an expertise in an area like access controls, badging, uniforms, everything adds to the goal of the enterprise. Everything's a priority. That was my mindset. Steve, you had Sony Pictures. Seven billion in revenue, about 9,500 employees, one of the big five film studios in the United States. We know the, the Karate Kid, James Bond, Men in Black, Spider-Man, just to name a few. So much has come out of there. This is a mini city. And, and you've invited me there many times. And, I, and every time I've gone there, I've been so impressed at what goes on. You know, there's a perimeter. And then once you come inside, it's, it's an entire city that functions on its own. It's got its own fire department. You know, and there's and there's so much activity, but there's people, there's crews, they're on, they're in the studios, they're on the the lot, but they're also globally all over the world. Right. And when you start thinking about safety and security risks and threats that exist to these crews, in the in some of the most austere areas, you know, filming television right. and movies, you know, it's not only security, but there's safety risks here, and there's travel risks there. And the IP threat right. is absolutely massive because leakage of any of these films prior to, to even and from even when the scripts are written, you know, results in loss of billions of dollars. Right. And, and you said at the beginning that you have to have a business mindset as a chief security officer. You have to understand how the business makes money because at the end of the day, what, what really are we there to do? Protect the company's ability to make money is a, is a core component of that. Personnel, people safety, top of the priority there, as well as these other things. And we've seen what happens when that breaks down. Things like the Alex Baldwin accidental shooting on the set of Rust. You know, horrific event. With complexity of this magnitude and this blend of the safety aspect, the security aspect, how, do you, how did you look at building and focusing that program on a daily basis? Great question. Um, when I started there, they were really dependent on analog, right? Mm -hmm. So you had these big reels of prints, 70 millimeter, 35 millimeter, you're shipping them all over the world, lots of people touch them. Um, and the piracy issues all over the world were huge, really impact the business. Leakage of films, leakage of everything, it was, it was not a good situation. But remember, we didn't just produce on that lot. We produced, as you said, all over the world. Mm -hmm and in some hell holes, right? Because you want to get the right scene, yeah. the right whatever. <laughs> and, and it's like so, putting a podcast studio up here yeah. on the, the conference center exactly. floor. As we built our program, and I'll talk just a moment about that, um, the more and more we did, what we realized is the rest of Sony didn't really have me. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time in Tokyo um, working with them and sharing what we were doing but Sony had 160,000 people all over the world doing unbelievable work with new technologies and what have you. So we had that to deal with. And, um, and when I came to, to Sony Pictures, I was hired as VP of security. When I left, I was executive vice president and I had anything in the world that needed protection of some kind. So it was content, it was you know, all digital assets, it was people, not, so not in that order, people first obviously. Yeah. Uh, brick and mortar, um, travel, uh, response, resilience. We had to build programs that were resilient. We had to be, doesn't matter what happens, you got to be able to come back, including when North Korea tries to destroy your business. So the other thing I want to say, and I think it's important to get out here, uh, we heard it yesterday in one of the sessions that he and I did. We probably missed the boat many, many years ago when we started really focusing on physical security and not on digital security. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the security professionals that we know today don't have digital. 
And I think what we're going to start to see is more of a convergence there because the CEO doesn't want to call five people for security. He wants to call one. Right. Right. Or for risk or, or for resilience. So the titles are changing as well. Right. The responsibilities, the roles are changing to more about risk mitigation, risk identification, good intelligence and resilience. Your ability to rebound and recover no matter what. Let's talk about the North Korea piece for a minute because you've both have been involved in these events that have really changed not the security industry and changed the world and changed many, all of our lives in so many ways. I mean, Rich with United's involvement with, with the hijackings on 9-11 and Steve with North Korea that you brought up. You go to work and the guardians of peace have seized and locked ev the, the systems of Sony Pictures and locked everybody out. In response to what I will say right now was actually a pretty damn funny movie. <laughs> The interview with, with Seth Kim Rogen and didn't James see it that way. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? So it was actually November 24th, Thanksgiving week. Oh, sorry. 2014. I don't, I don't um, not that I would want to remember that, yeah. but uh, I never will forget it. People tell me I should write all this down. It's like, no, it's right here <laughs> forever. Um, when you live a moment like that, a near extinction event, like Maersk did in the shipping, uh -huh. and there's other companies that have, um, some of what he's been through, um, you never forget it. And so I think what was so important about it is that we had done, we had business continuity planning, we had 150 plans written and distributed. Um, so we had a really, you know, you met a lot of the team. We had a great team of people. And, and when it happened, they had already been in six months. We didn't realize it. Yeah. When, when we saw the Guardians of Peace on the screen, that was a wiper malware. So when you connected from anywhere in the world, we're in 50 countries, 150 locations, plus all the productions. When you connected, the meltdown on your, on your hard drive started. And within a few seconds, all that data is gone forever. Wow. So what we decided to do day one, and these are decisions. When I was talking about making decisions now yep. instead of later. How about this one? You're gonna unplug worldwide to stop the bleeding. What does that mean? Who makes that decision? What is the impact of that? Yeah. Because guess what? Now you got a business to run that's publicly traded. It's a global stop. You went dark. You have no internet. You have no connectivity. How do you run your business pre-internet? I mean, I, we would tell people that we've gotta do that. And like, should I go home? I don't have a job now. <laughs> Uh, my job was data entry and the computer doesn't work. No, actually, take a piece of paper, <laughs> here's a pen, and we're going to teach you how to run the business <laughs> like, without that. It's like, wait, does anybody have paper? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> no. when you say it changed the world, it did. That was an unprecedented attack where a nation state, and it was proven, it, it was them. Yeah. POTUS and, and Director Comey made attribution on December 19th. How'd they do that? Because they saw the evidence. So the other decision that was made that day one, this is so important. We brought the FBI in, and they and this is went through holidays and months and months. They really helped us. The Department of Justice, the U.S. Attorney's Office, they were all over it. And and the concern was we might lose control, or they might see things, or what. You know what? We never for a moment regretted that. And the important thing about this today is in your planning, you better know who you're going to call, and you better start to build relationships with law enforcement and government, and you better build trust. And you better learn to partner because you can't do this alone. Yeah, yeah. That, the the public-private partnership thing is something that you've each talked a lot about. Right. I mean, that's where you have organizations like OSAC, like DSAC, who are there to develop these relationships. So you know who's on the other side right. of that phone call. In so many ways, I mean, we, in LA, you know, when I, when I was there, we worked so hard to develop that. DSAC relationship right. with everybody there. I mean, you guys hosted the conference, yep. you know, one year on one of the studio yep. sets, and that was that was that, that was so impactful to be able to understand. Okay, well, these are the key players. If I have, an, I have, you know, I call this person. Right. And Rich, nine eleven was one of the most defining moments that we've had, I mean, as, as, a, as a country and, and as a world. I mean, I've talked a lot about it and the fact that, you know, when you look, it's the only time in history that the uh, articles, uh, you know, Article 5 of NATO has been introduced. 
when we think about what happened, you know, th- that that day, and you've certainly, I know, have been put through the ringer, you know, since since then, in so many different conversations. Talk about how the events unfolded that day from your angle. Well, we all know what happened. We all remember what happened, and so many of us uh, have. You know, we dedicated the rest of our careers to never letting that happen again. Mm-hmm. Full scale, 24-7. That's what we had to do. I've used this word before. I'll use it again. It was a seismic event. In many ways, p 103, before it, was as world-changing as 9-11 continued to change our industry. It was a a vivid reminder that no matter what decade passes, you talked about the evolution, whether it's the uh, infamous terrorist groups of the 70s to today's infamous well-known terrorist groups. They continue to try to come at us, and it takes me right back to 9-11. You talk about business continuity and resilience. Uh, What a case study for the aviation industry, United American and everyone. If you recall, we are, were all grounded yeah, immediately. I mean, Steve talked about unplugging from the network. I mean, that's what the aviation industry did, ground every airplane. Everything was grounded, and we had to get back to work, and we did it days later, and we had to recover, and it was the most challenging uh, post-incident event that ever happened to our industry worldwide. And we did that over time. The incredible hard work of everybody touching this was, it was like the eternal flame at President Kennedy's grave. It never goes off. The people dedicated to this aviation security business do not turn off. And it's a constant reminder, no matter what the threat and no matter what the evolution You could still get a hijacking. You could still have a bomb effort. You could still have something to harm our people and our assets. And it's everybody's responsibility to contribute. So ever since 9-11, ever since Pan Am 103, ever since those first days of aviation security, and I'll remind everybody, next year is the 50th anniversary of airplane security. Everything you experience it's done for a reason. Okay, don't complain about having to take your shoes off. <laughs> it's done for a reason, yeah. as everybody knows why. Yeah. The shoe bomber, shoe bomber, the underwear bomber. Yeah. There are plots. The incredible work that the intelligence agencies do to try to find out what's brewing out there. The incredible work that the airline people do to do their job as required by the regulatory officials. Uh, it's been nonstop this entire time. And uh, hats off to the people that are continuing that work right now. And But even the aviation industry is not immune to s- cyber attacks. And I want to read a, a quote from, from Steve Aaron. He said, cyber attacks are escalating on a global basis. The costs and in- impacts are spiraling. Confusion over how best to prepare and even counter attacks requires a renewed focus. We can't insure our way out of this. We can't delegate and assume all is well. Cybersecurity is truly an enterprise responsibility, not just an IT issue. We used to fly airplanes with cables and with, you know, with, with a joystick and a couple of pedals, and airplanes now are flying computers. And there's, you know, we hear the stories about, you know, is the, is the next aviation cyber attack one in which you know, they seize control of avionics and you know someone's able to start downing aircraft remotely right which i I, but these companies sony united you you mentioned Maersk, have massive budgets for for things like cybersecurity and physical security when you think about the regular company the small business the medium-sized business the people who can't afford the the 10 million 20 million dollar ransom what can they do so Great question, um, and I think a good answer is the U.S. government, and this I'm just giving you one example, there are yeah. many other governments, Australia, U.K., and so on, but the U.S. government has a couple programs. One is CISA, C-I-S-A, another one is NIST, 
Um, there are also ISO standards. There's a whole bunch of really good material that's available. If you want to build a program, um, you can do that. But somebody's got to do it for you. It can't be like, oh, it's the other guy's problem. It'll never happen to me. Uh, yes, it will. It is happening. Ransomware is an example, number one form of attack. Unbelievable how many incidents there are that are not reported, mm -hmm. where they just pay the money. And, and what it's doing is it's feeling it's creating a cottage industry. So in certain countries, there are people that are experts in that, that are gunslingers, they're for hire. You wanna know how to hack? You wanna know what to do when you get in? You wanna know how to gather a ransom? You wanna know how to deal with Bitcoin? You can, it's all for hire. Yeah. Everybody gets a cut and, and they're not, you can't indict them and, and extradite them because you don't have those relationships. So these guys hide out in these locations and they do that. So well, I know we're gonna talk about the future of security as a profession um, or risk as a profession, however you wanna describe it. Uh, but as I said, everyone, so eight billion people in the world, five billion connected, 5G, you know, high speeds, um, I, it's just going to get more and more of that. What does that mean? What does it mean? It's a risky world. It's fun, right? And it, it's how you have to manage, but it's also with not without risk. So I think we got to pay a lot more attention to educating the workforce and engaging them and helping the company and helping not only themselves at work, but also teach them good cyber hygiene. It carries out into the private sector. So their personal lives, their family, their kids, their grandparents, because everybody's online and everybody is potentially a victim. And a lot of the victims you don't ever hear about, but it's not a good situation, yeah. right? So I, I really, as, as you know, I'm, I'm such a promoter of this and a believer in you talk about maybe airlines, you know, being compromised through cyber. Automobiles, another one. Yeah, right? automobiles. Oh my God. Yeah. So I. Tesla is a big computer. Here's what you got to remember. Most of the ways that we do lead our lives today, how businesses run, are going to be about connectivity. Think about the Internet of Things and all the devices that you can buy off the shelf and plug in, and now all of a sudden there's another vector that's going to allow somebody, if they want, to get into you and compromise you. And in time out, we've got to really pay a little more attention to that. Yeah. Have fun with it, but understand the risk. Yeah, they push software mm -hmm. updates to your vehicle sitting in your garage now. I mean, I had one of my cars wouldn't start. All of a sudden, I had a call. That I had a call. I understand what happened. They told me like what to push on the screen. Reboot. And they, yeah, and they <laughs> said that. Oh, we pushed a software update last night. If your car was in the garage, it could not have taken properly. Like, and now my car is completely not functional, huh. even though it takes gas. Wow, it's crazy. Let's talk about where we're going. Rich, you said security, like safety, is our culture. Safety is a part of everybody's responsibility. Security is part of everybody's responsibilities. It's just embedded in our daily thought process through our worldwide network. The safety and security of our employees and customers is our top priority every day. I say every security organization, every company has to develop a culture of this personal responsibility. I built the triangle and at the bottom of it, it says that in this, in this pyramid, personal responsibility starts everything. Without it, we can we could buy everything on this floor, but if we don't develop a culture where people care about the implementation and, and are willing to implement and adhere to a standard, it almost won't matter. When you talk about building this culture and embracing it and accepting it and not forcing it upon people, how do you do that? It's a lifelong responsibility in the, in the security world. What's most important is finding your people, developing your people, supporting your people, and investing in them. Training them, finding different people that have different expertises, finding people that have visionary thought process. For instance, in the 70s and 80s, we weren't thinking about drones. We're thinking about them yeah. now but we can't stop thinking about what we were thinking about in the 70s and 80s because it just grows and grows and grows all of the avenues for people to do harm at us. It's the people that are so important, both internal employees or looking for people from external areas. 
People need to understand how intelligence works. People need to, need to understand what the day-to-day -day execution is. We need to work with our people around the globe to make sure they're executing their day-to-day -day responsibilities. In one word, auditing. Go yeah. out there and learn and teach and show them. Make sure they're doing things right. But investing in people and training them and supporting them is the path to success in that arena. Steve? Security, um, I think what we have to do going forward is to realize that this is not about, you know, this company is really good and strong in these areas and this one's not, shame on you. It's not about that. It's about you better know where you are today if, you know, if you're going to want to know where you're going, right? And it's about continuous improvement. So as he said, audit. Where are you? It's okay. Maybe you're not in good shape. Maybe you are. Maybe you need to spend more or reallocate resources. It's okay. It's fine. But, but do something about it. And, and as far as engaging the workforce, um, the, if you help them understand why it's important to them and to their employer, I think they'll, they'll be much more willing to do that. The problem we have, and I'm very concerned about it, we talk about future, is the distributed workforce, the work from anywhere. Not, yeah. not just work from home, work from anywhere. Plug in here, plug in there, I'm at Starbucks, whatever. It's okay, but is it a safe network, right? So, and how do you manage remotely? How do you, how do you set up a proper environment for someone who's working out of an apartment or with, a, with their kids around and with your wife has also got her business and you're trying to do yours and how do you safeguard sensitive data? I mean, the list is a mile long. And, and how do you manage? How do you recognize with mental health, which is a big issue and it's getting worse, how do you recognize when someone's got a problem and how do you deal with that? How do you fire somebody? How do you onboard somebody? So the whole issue of mental health, of, of work from anywhere, we're not going to see what we saw before. All these buildings that contained all the workforce, uh, a lot of them are going to stay empty or, or they can be occupied a day here and a day there. Um, I think we're going to see some bankruptcies and some buildings that are gutted that will never be occupied. We're going to see those repurposed, right, because they're just not going to be used that way anymore. Right. You know, the plug and play idea of I don't need to have an office with nice windows and a couch and all that, which I did have, as you know. Um, <laughs> it was a nice right? office. It was, oh, it was awesome. <laughs> and right, a view right down the studio lot. Oh, there's Cameron Diaz. And, anyway. <laughs> right? <laughs> don't have to have that. Um, you just walk in somewhere, plug in and play, and then do your thing and go home. Or don't go there. Um, but we, we haven't really figured it out. COVID drove it. We haven't figured out how to manage it very well. We joked that you both retired. You said you retired. I joked that neither one of you seems to have retired, even if you're not in the roles that you held for so long. But there's... The generation of leadership in security is is up and coming, and you know one of the, the I think the tasks that you have both taken on valiantly in your retirement is how do we develop and train this next generation of leader in the security industry? We talk about the nine characteristics of performance used by Special Operations Command in the assessment and recruitment of special operators, whether you're a Green Beret, a Navy SEAL an Army Ranger, you know, Air Force operator, MARSOC, Raider, drive, resiliency, adaptability, humility, integrity, curiosity, team ability, effective intelligence, emotional strength make up these nine. When you think about those who come after you, those who have to take the helm of these organizations and build this industry in this new environment that we've talked so much about, what are you looking for in those leaders? The day, you, the day you hire somebody is day one of hopefully the rest of their career <laughs> because our security industry is so magnetic. It just draws you in. It's, it's like that uh, uh, Al Pacino movie. I just keep <laughs> getting dragged back into this. <laughs> people stay in security for a lifetime. So many people I know stay for a lifetime. And when you have employees in your industry, both with your company, your competitors, the people in the industry, the members of OSAC, the members of DSAC, we meet so many security professionals that contribute to what we're trying to accomplish. 
you become a family. And people do move around, but quite often they move to other companies, their security departments, mm -hmm. because people shine. People get reputations. People move on to new opportunities. And it is, we're all interlinked. And that's the value of our industry, the people and contacts that we have, who's good, who's where, because believe me, wherever they go, they contribute to what you're trying to accomplish. All boats rise and all boats sink at different occasions in our world. But we benchmark with each other. We push our people to succeed. I may work for them someday. They may work for me another time. People move. It begins on day one. And what we do is just plain magnetic. And uh, I, I think that a lot of people do aspire to higher positions. Uh, they do well. We've watched people, Steve, for decades yep. uh, start in the kitchen and all of a sudden they're a CSO <laughs> in a new industry. It, it's it's um, part of the attractiveness and charm of our, of our work. Yeah. I'll just add, and Rich and I have been talking about this this week a lot. Um, we've been successful. We've had an amazing careers. We know a lot of other friends here that are in similar roles to what we are. They've got their own business now. They're doing some consulting and whatever. We must find ways to give back to the next generation of security professionals, help them along, nurture them, develop them, find them, um, promote them, blah, 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 right? And we've got to do more to give back. One of the reasons we're sitting right here is to try to give back, yeah. right? That we, it's an obligation that we have that we can't ignore. Yeah. I want to ask about your work with ISOS and who's, who we're, we're, we're sitting in the booth here. I've worked with ISOS in previous roles. I mean, we live in a complex world. Risk exists in everything that we do, especially when we, talk, when we talked a minute ago about traveler safety and you know, putting people in remote locations, whether they're travelers or that's their place of duty you know, for, for many of our, of our organizations. Crazy things happen in the world. You know, can you talk a minute about ISOS, the mission behind the organization, and the work that you're each doing with them? I think SOS has been in existence over 30 years now. Um, it's a fascinating company that makes a difference in people's lives every moment. Um, I brought them in in my early days at Sony Pictures, mm -hmm. and we then had the Sony contract, right? So it was all of Sony, and the services they provided were invaluable. Um, so I got to work with them as a client, right? And I saw what they did. And, and I was actually at the table as they were developing new technologies, I would pilot um, and see what worked and what didn't and help them understand the industry better. So I got to know a few people in the company and uh, when I started to announce that I was gonna be starting my own business in, in 18 and, and retiring, <laughs> um, <laughs> the CEO of, of the Americas for International SOS said, call me. So I called him and he said, let's set something up with a program, we'll call it strategic security advisors, right? For the company that we're not full-time employees, but we're there anytime you want us. You want to kick around an idea. You want to understand better what's going on in the industry. Um, all good. And so we, we did that and then we brought Rich in. We brought Kelly Johnstone from Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. um, and then we've got another guy in the, in the mix with us, um, John Rendero, who at one time in his career with, with DS, every RSO in the world reported to him. Amazing guy. Yeah. So we have a real cadre of people that, that can deliver. What SOS does is not only medical, it does security. It's now, it does intelligence. As you know, it does it, yeah. but risk advisory, travel planning, journey management. And they're in 27 different call centers around the world where they're staffed by doctors and nurses and security professionals, and they, they can handle 90 languages. There's really nobody, I mean, one of the reasons we're here, there isn't anybody else that offers what they offer right. that makes that big a difference in people's lives. They do medevacs, and I, I'm sorry to go on and on, but no, it's no, amazing yeah. company, what they do. Um, Rich? Steve covered it very well. Um, in my four years here, uh, despite the pandemic, uh, 
I think we average about six to eight conference calls at least a month, yeah. at least. Oh, yeah. uh, listening to what our people are saying, listening to what we're asking. They ask us what we're doing, who we're meeting with. You've mentioned it several times, Fran. OSAC, DSAC, ISMA, benchmarking. Do you know anybody here? Do you know anybody there? But the thing that jumps out at me with, with our group here is the people. And I've said it before in this last hour, security people have passion. And these kids have passion here. They want to do the right thing. Two of these people to my right were on the first plane to Ukraine uh, this year. They were on the ground with John Rendero. They're right there. They want to help people. And that's the magnet that makes me uh, love this group of people here. They want to do what's right for people. They're extremely interested in the safety and security and health of people. And that's why it's fun to be a part of this group every day. I love it. Yeah, and they're, I mean, I've worked with them all across Africa, uh, even in the DOD capacity, you know, where to right. augment, you know, places where you can't always get you know, government assets in, you know, and they're civilian organization that can go, sometimes can go places you can't go as the U.S. government. And, they and a lot of a lot. what they deal with is so complex. Yeah. We had a, a guy out of our Hong Kong office who's American. We were making a movie on the Tibetan border. He drives 12 hours. They get in a head-on collision. He dies on the scene. And they won't, re you, you got to bring the family to release the scene, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And we want to repatriate him. And S I called SOS. They managed the whole thing. We got him back to his family and he was Japanese descent. Uh, long story, but I could give you a whole list of stuff yeah. like that, that that they deal with all the time. They make a difference, right? So we talk about why are we here? The safeguarding of people and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Safety is, is a huge part of that, right? I, I need to feel safe and secure. With these guys, you do. Yeah, yeah we talk about risk mitigation. Yeah. Talk, that that's they sit in the in squarely in that area to help you as a chief security officer director of security building programs understand if i identify what my threats are and now i have to build a mitigation program against it we can take these guys we can put them in there and they're going to augment our internal capabilities all day long anywhere in the world right so truly an impactful organization yep. you each also have your consulting businesses bernard global and Rich Davis Security Consulting. So what's going on with those? <laughs> Again, uh, that word retirement. <laughs> uh, you know, if you have your health and you still feel passionate about what you do and you're making a difference, why not? Um, I, as I've told you, I spent my whole life building a book uh, with really great people in it. Um, government, private sector, friends. And when I was thinking about retiring or slowing down, I thought, I'm not closing the book. That, that's really what drives me. And now it's probably twice as big as it was before. And it's what nurtures me and, and it helps me feel like I'm making a difference and giving back. So um, the business is amazing because the phone rings uh, quite often and every time it's something different. And if you're okay with that, that's amazing. And, and you really are able to make a difference in people's lives. I think today more than ever, uh, people like us, um, there's a shortage of skills, right? We have them, we're available, you know, um, why not? Pick the phone up, kick an idea around, yeah. and we don't always start the clock running and, and bill people, we want to give back. So sometimes we do, it depends. Like I think most of the government work we volunteer, we don't get a penny for it, yeah. we just do it. We were at breakfast today and somebody said, don't do anything for free, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I do almost everything for free. <laughs> uh, my business is uh, uh, simple. Uh, I have a few clients uh, since 2018. Uh, a lot of it affiliated with airport industry issues. Uh, I'm primar primarily in it uh, to stay connected with my friends that I uh, grew to know for the last 30 years in security. Uh, I love them, love them to death, love working, love helping them. And uh, if anything can help us afford a couple of trips here and there, me and my wife, and we do travel quite a bit. Uh, it's very satisfying. Of, <laughs> right. of, of course, you know. Only on United. Uh, <laughs> very satisfying, and uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the time. As we close out, 
the Jedbergs needed to do three things every day to be successful. They had to be able to shoot, they had to be able to move, and they had to be able to communicate. If they did these three things as core foundational tasks, we call them habits, if you will, and they did them to a high level of precision, they could focus their attention and their efforts on other more complex challenges that came their way. What are the three things that you each do every day to set the conditions for success in your world? When we wake up in the morning, we go, yes, (laughs) (laughs) it's another day, (laughs) you know, and uh, in our offices or in our homes. Um, But I think for me, I had a boss at Sony and when I retired, I said to him, a very successful guy, global British guy, what do you recommend? He said, you, you probably won't even understand why I'm going to tell you this, but listen to it. Manage your calendar. And when, you, when you're not in that office anymore, or whether you are, you know what it's about? It's about when I say I'm going to do something, I better do it. And that's me. I, I just cannot miss something. When I tell you I'm going to do it, I will find a way to do it. Or I'll tell you I can't do it right then, but I'll do it later. So manage the calendar. I've got two calendars that I am religious about. So the other one is plan my day. Guess what, though? My day changes by the moment. I change by the moment. So I think being resilient in that sense is really important. Uh, Enjoying the day a little bit, you know, find a break. I can walk out in the balcony, pet the dog, and come back, and I'm refreshed and and, uh, ready to go again. So you got to have a little bit of that balance um, as well. And then the final one for me, as I talked about the network, every day I talk to new people I haven't talked to in a while to keep it vibrant, to keep it alive, to find out what others are doing. And I learn a lot. And I'll give you one more. I, I really pay a lot of attention to world events, what's happening, how does that affect me and my clients? Rich? Fran, um, when I think about three things, I guess I have to go with exercise and maintaining health, number one. I put a high priority on that. I walk seven days a week uh, as much as I can. Uh, summer months, it's great. I, I walk and I'm talking to Steve and everybody <laughs> else I work with while I'm walking. Two things at once. When it gets a little colder in Chicago, I'm on the treadmill. So Which staying is like eight, nine months out of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Exercise and health, number one. Steve mentioned it third. I'll put it second. I stay on top of world events. And I stay on top of them to understand the security view and the security challenges resulting from worldwide events. So staying on top of the world news, both within uh, the US and outside, extremely important, especially with our roles at International Outs West. And number three, I'm gonna go with this one. Not change too much from who I've been in the last 30 years in security and 40 years at United. I want to maintain what I, what I accomplished in those 40 years, stay the same person that I became, and uh, continue that uh, with the people I continue to work with. Steve, manage your calendar, plan the day, build a network, and the fourth, pay attention to world events. So we got a bonus one for you. Rich, exercise, maintain your health, stay on the world events to understand the effects. Right. And be proactive. We talked about preparation, you know, a bit ago. And three, be the same person that you were. And even though you grew to be the chief security officer of United Airlines, you still started in the kitchen. I'm <laughs> proud of it. And I'm, I'm proud, proud of, of it. it. Those people work it. very hard and they contribute to security as well. And maybe in f- maybe in 30 or 40 years, the next chief security officer is sitting in the kitchen today. I'd still rather see Elvis in the Rolling Stones, <laughs> but I cherish that experience. <laughs> I mentioned the nine characteristics of elite performance that we talk about. We all, as high performers, you demonstrate all nine of these in varying capacities, rarely and almost never all of them at the same time. But depending on the situation that you're faced with, you demonstrate a number of them. 
we mentioned in our conversation here, world changing events that you've each demonstrated all of these at some point in those responses. We talked about what it's going to take to build the next leader in this industry. At the end of these conversations, I take one and I think about my conversation with, with my guests and, and the one that really defines who they are and what they exhibit to me. And for this conversation, for each of you, Steve Rich, it's this concept of effective intelligence and effective intelligence is defined as our ability to take the aggregate experiences of our past, the things that we've seen, how, who we've interacted with, the environment that we've operated in and learn from it, apply it to our future decisions and our current behavior and our view on in the world and position ourselves to make better organizations for ourselves, our teams, and our organizations based on that. You have led some of the most complex organizations in the world, massive scale, massive impact to all of society, I would say. And you have done that with the utmost success. As I mentioned in the beginning, I thank you so much. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your mentorship. Thanks for taking some time with me here today. And I look forward to the next chapter. Great interview. Thank you, Fran. Thank you very much, Fran. Very flattering. I appreciate it. American Jedbergs went out to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Director to the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your creator and host, Fran Rochopi. Join us next week for a new episode on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on YouTube for full episodes, highlights, and other behind-the-scenes content. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Rochopi, Talent War Group, and our sponsor, Jersey Mike Subs, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As former members of Special Operations Forces, the Jedberg Podcast and Talent War Group contribute a percentage of all profits to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, supporting the families of our fallen warriors. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.